Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows. His name is John. And they were all astounded. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loose, and he began to speak praise of God. Fear came on all those looking around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All those who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? The hand of the Lord is certainly with him. Be seated. Well, as I look out over the audience. <clears throat> It appears that most of the folks that are away from us, either the young people who have gone to college, those who are, are transporting them to college and have not yet returned home, or those who are traveling for whatever reason, and those that might be out uh, because of medical problems or whatever, they almost sit over there. <laughs> because this side is relatively full and this side has got a a lot of empty spaces. And I hope that that means that each and every one of you will miss them as much as I do because it is always the great, great pleasure of mine each Lord's Day to be able to look out over the audience and see my brothers and sisters in Christ, to see your faces, to see you as you pay attention to the things that I have to say to know of the love <clears throat> that is a part of this family that we have here at the Hammond Church, that the, the love that I have for you and each and every one of you is reciprocated, and I appreciate that so very, very much. Tom, I failed to give you this one announcement this morning, and that is that I will go tomorrow for an ultrasound test on my legs to see if they can determine what is wrong with them, <laughs> because they will work. Uh, so, at any rate, please uh, keep me in your prayers as well in regard to that. <clears throat> the sermon that I am presenting this morning is, uh, I'd have to say, not my favorite in, order, uh, in regard to the subject matter and what is involved in presenting it. But it was a sermon that was requested, and I have uh, recently felt really uh, compelled to pay close attention to the requests that the members of the congregation have in regard to sermons because I figure that that means that they're aware of something that they feel is needed by the congregation that maybe I have not seen fit to uh, address. I know that uh, our elders uh, constantly are telling me, Bill, you need to get out of your comfort zone sometimes and to preach those lessons that are not necessarily the ones that you would prefer to preach. And this, of course, is one of them. But I do appreciate that very much because, as was mentioned, even today we need to step out of our comfort zone sometimes in order for us to be faithful in doing the Lord's work. The word epidemic is defined by Webster as spreading rapidly and extensively a rapid growth or development, that which is prevalent. And I think that there would probably be a number of thoughts that come to your mind <clears throat> in regard to the idea of an epidemic. And because of 2020, maybe many of our minds would have gone to that. That's not what we're talking about this morning. What I've been asked to address and what I'll be talking about this morning is the fact that there is a lack of fatherly guidance in the home. And it's an epidemic type of situation. It is something that is very prevalent in our society. That we are seeing generation after generation of young men who do not know what it means to be a man. 
They don't know what it means to be a husband. They don't know what it means to be a father. They don't know what it means to be a responsible individual in regard to taking care of the responsibilities that they have been given by God himself in order to be pleasing to him. And so it's not just the young men, of course, that I want you and hope that you young men are going to pay very close attention, but it's for all of us, myself included, in, in regard to the fact that there is an awesome responsibility that God has given to men and to mankind in regard to our relationship with Him and how we equip ourselves in our relationship with those that we have influence on in our lives. I first of all want to point out that the scriptures tell us, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now that is not a hard, hard rule. I mean, God is not saying if you do your job as a parent to the very best of your ability, your child is going to grow up, they're going to obey the gospel, and they're going to be faithful to the Lord all their lives. He's not saying that that is an absolute. What he is saying, though, is especially parents, both men and women, pay attention to this because what God says is that you have a very profound influence upon your children and you help mold them in, in regard to the way that they think about life in regard to what they think about their relationship with God, their, uh, what they are responsible to God for. And I want you to look at this picture, and I hope it's large enough for very much all of you to see. If you can't, at least the little boy that's on the bicycle has got this huge smile on his face. And may I suggest to you that that smile is not there because he's learning to ride the bicycle, even though I'm pretty sure that that has something to do with it. I think the smile is there because Daddy is spending time with him. Daddy is spending time with him. Psychologist tells us that the one thing that young people, that children want more than anything else that you can possibly give them, and as, as unlikely and as, as far-fetched as it might seem to you, more than electronic devices or whatever, Xander has uh, got his driving permit. I was kidding with him before we started this morning, asking him if he was caught speeding on the way to church assembly this morning because he drove the family over. But more than, than becoming more and more dependent because of your mobility, more than the electronic devices that obviously uh, uh, just almost totally uh, consume young people's lives, it's time, according to child psychologists, it's time that young people want with their parents, and in particularly, they want with daddy. We're told... <laughs> by those who study such things, that time di uh, diaries suggest fathers don't live, who don't live with their children spend about 36 minutes a week with them, compared to 7.8 hours a week for dads who did live with their children. And this comes from 2022, this data chapter, uh, 2021, 2022. May I suggest that you look very closely at those numbers. For a father who is divorced or whatever and does not live at home with the family, they usually, on average, according to the, the time diary, diaries that are kept, they average five minutes a day with their children. I know it seems longer than that, but I've been up here for about five minutes. And that's it. Even fathers who live at home, who spend almost eight hours a day, that's just a little over an hour a day with their children. Now, I understand that uh, pe people have to earn a living. They work eight-hour days, some of them ten hours a day, five days a week, some of them even six days a week. But that does not mean that we, especially as fathers, and I'm, you know, I'm presenting this mostly for the members, the male members of the congregation, doesn't mean that we're excused for not spending some time with our children. I grew up in a, fa in a family that our father at first owned a battery radiator business, and he worked about 10 hours a day. He would come home, 
and he'd eat the, in, the evening meal with the rest of us, and then he'd get on the tractor and go tend to the farm until it was dark, at which time he would come home. And as tired as he was, and as busy as he was, he gave all of our family the most precious gift, other than God, of course, is that we felt absolutely secure because he took time to make us feel safe and loved. That's what children are looking for. That's what they want more than anything else. Let's look at some statistics. The U.S. Department of Health and Human uh, Services says that 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 60% of the youth uh, suicides are from fatherless homes. Children without the father living at home are at a dramatically greater risk of drug and alcohol use, and children without the father in the home are twice as likely to drop out of school. I, I just really like looking at statistics, so I'm going to give you a few more. 18.3 million children, American children, that's about 25%, live without their biological fa uh, father. That's from the National Fatherhood Initiative. 80% of the children in 1960 grew up with both biological parents in the home. A decade later in 1970, that had decreased to just 70%. You go another decade in 1990, or two decades, and only 494 Less than 50% by 1990 were living in a home where both biological parents were available. Fortunately, in 2020, the latest statistic I had, it had gone back up to 60%. But when you think about that, that still means that 40% of American children are not in a home where mommy and daddy reside. And the fact of the matter is that this same organization says that fatherlessness problem facing America. And I think that that is an amazing thing for us to be brought to an awareness of. That of all the problems that we've got in the United States today, of all the problems as far as the morality that has gone into the tank as far as the fact that it's a very dangerous nation to live in anymore, the fact that we have so many people who are uneducated because the education system has deteriorated significantly. And I certainly don't mean to uh, say anything in, in, because we have some educators here. And I'm sure that if they were to speak up or asked to, be, to speak up, they would say that they understand that, that they're not even allowed to teach children like they want to anymore. But according to this National Center for Fathering, they say the biggest problem as far as society is concerned <clears throat> is the fatherlessness that is found in American homes. And they also made this statement, you can be absent as a father even though you are physically present in the home. And so there again, it's a matter of fatherlessness that we're talking about. That the fathers, the men of our nation are falling down on the job, job terribly because they're not assuming the responsibilities and taking on the responsibilities that God has given us because, ladies, I know that, and we'll look at that in just a moment, I know that God has said that the lady and the women are to be in submission to their, father, to their husbands, and I know that sometimes that's hard to take, and I'll comment about that in just a moment as well. But be sure that you get the better end of the bargain because we men will stand before Jesus Christ and give an account how we equip ourselves as far as being the spiritual leader that we're going to look at in just a moment of those who are in our family. And the larger the family, the more responsibility, fellas, that you have. It's something that we need to be grossly concerned about and very much aware of. Our young people need 
good leadership from the Father. They need good examples from the Father. And these are all things that I want to amplify on as we go along. But this is something that is just critically important, especially for God's people, to make sure that we are not contributing to the problem that our nation is experiencing at this time. I'd like to share a verse of scripture with you from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Paul writing to Timothy said, Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith, pierced themselves with many griefs, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue rich, uh, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And perhaps you're asking yourself right now, what does that have to do with what you have introduced as the lesson for this morning? Well, it has everything to do with it, men. Because in those verses of Scripture, Paul talks to Timothy, writes to Timothy, and he reminds him, that you, man of God, you, man of God, you need to turn away from the, from the lurement of riches, which is obviously great. We live in a nation, a capitalistic nation, that places great emphasis upon income, upon possessions of things. It is a nation wherein people work incredibly long hours so that they can get ahead so that they can afford to spend money on things that they want and desire as opposed to just the needs of their family and themselves. And in doing so then, they wander away from the faith, Paul says to Timothy. They pierce themselves with many griefs and, before, and because of all of that, you man of God, you need to pay attention to what is really important. And this morning, what's really important for each and every one of us men and young men is to make sure that we are pursuing becoming a man of God and growing as a man of God. I study in Vince, I heard that amen, and I knew it was you, brother. Vince and I have been studying each week for quite a number of, of well, a long time, actually. And things were going okay. But then we got to this verse of scripture. And ever since then, he and I, in our study of God's word, has been from the perspective of how that applies to Vince and myself. And I hope for all of you who are here, men, be a man of God. Strive with all your heart to be a man of God. Because if you will, it doesn't make any difference what kind of problems you have. It might be financial problems. It might be marital problems. It might be problems with your children. It might be problems at work or whatever the case may be. It doesn't make any difference. If you will work in your relationship with God, guess what? All of those problems either are solved or they're made much less problems. Because it just stands to reason if we are God-like, all of those things will be better. And so thinking about man being a man of God, let's take a look at man, a man of God as a spiritual leader. And I suspect that many of you in this congregation have a, a plaque somewhere on your wall in your home of Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which uh, were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you'll notice that I've really put the emphasis on those two words where Joshua said, we will. Personally, I think that as Joshua addressed the people there, that when he got to that point, he said, but as for me and my, and my house, we will serve the Lord. But let me hasten to say this, folks, especially men. 
you can tell your family, we will serve the Lord. But if you are not showing them that we will serve the Lord, if you don't show them that every Sunday and every Wednesday or every time we have a gospel meeting or the winter lectureship or whatever, any and every time that we have the opportunity to assemble together as God's people, if you do not show your family, man, how excited you are and how much it means for you to be in those assemblies, you can say all you want to, you can scream it at the top of your lungs, we will serve the Lord, and that's just going to go right over their head. Because everybody is looking for whomever it is that is talking to be the example, to show them. We're going to serve the Lord because this is what makes us have a better life. This is what allows us to live in, in hope of eternal life. This is what makes us a part of a bigger and greater family, spiritual family. And that is because we will serve the Lord. Spiritual leader, we will. And I'm going to show you what it means we will. Is what the Bible teaches us. Statistics show that if both father and mother attend worship services, 72% of the children will attend when they are grown. Now this, of course, is statistics gathered from all the different religions of, of, in the United States. But 72% of the children will attend when they are grown. If only the father goes, 55% will go when they are grown. If only the mother attends with the kids, only 15% of the children will attend when they grow. So you can see the importance, men and women, but men, you can see the importance of you being the spiritual leader in your household. That you need not only, you lead not only by word of mouth, but especially by your example. Now, how excited you are and how much you love God's word and how much you want to please God. And I know that because even, even despite, despite the fact that I was a preacher at the time, there were two or three times that I, I told my family, well, we, we're going to have a family devotion. And it only lasted for a few weeks. And then somehow or another, it just kind of trailed off. And that's easy. That's very easy for that to happen. Brethren, it's not, it's not a matter of finding time for God and His Word. It is a matter of making time for God and His Word. And men, primarily that responsibility falls on you. And daddies, you're the one that's supposed to make sure that they understand the importance of that by your example. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But they have to see that. Secondly, the man of God as an exemplar husband. We're told in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and 28, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So a husband ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. And when you look at that verse in connection with 1 Timothy chapter 6 in regard to John, uh, Paul calling Timothy, you man of God, that becomes much more powerful in what it says. You man of God, you, if you're going to be a man of God, you love your wife as much as you love yourself. Even more than that, you love your wife, treat your wife, respect your wife, live with your wife in the same way that Christ loves his body, the church. And in regard to you ladies, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. The wife must, must see to it that she respects her husband. But don't, for, don't think that I'm getting off track here and going to the wives rather than the men. I am not. Because wives being subjective to their husbands is directly proportionate, as far as I'm concerned, as them giving them a reason to willingly submit to their husband and respect for them. In other words, men, if you want your wife to respect you, 
as a leader. Be a leader. Most importantly, be a spiritual leader that can give them some confidence and some hope in regard to eternity. Because everybody here wants to live forever. And we can and we do in Jesus Christ. But men, we're the ones that are supposed to tell and show the family about that. Man of God as a provider. Pay close attention to this, please. But if any provide not for his own, and specifically for those of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That ought to wake us up, men. Because God has given us primarily the responsibility of making the provisions for the physical and those kinds of needs of the family. We're told in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if, you, if any would not work, neither should he eat. And the fact of the matter is, we look in Ephesians 4, and it was mentioned a little bit this morning by Brother Lamarck, and Lamarck, thank you for those comments. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. I've made this comment several times, I'll say it again, that Ephesians 4 and verse 28 says, men... We need to be the provider. We need to go to work and we're to go to work with the idea in mind, I'm going to have money or whatever resources are at my disposal to share with somebody who has need. Someone who is not as well blessed as I am. That is part of the reason that we're supposed to go to work according to God. But look at it carefully. If we don't do that, if we won't work with our own hands, God says, you know what? You're worse than an unbeliever. You're worse than an infidel. If you're so lazy that you can't get up in the morning and go to work and earn a living and support your family, if you are such to where you don't want to do anything except laze around and let somebody else provide for you, then you don't even deserve to get to eat because you're not a man of God. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O sluggard? When will you arise out of your sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come as a vagabond and your want as an armed man. Unfortunately, as I mentioned just a moment ago, there's just too many men in our country today that would rather just laze around and let somebody else do the work and be the provider. May that never be among God's people because God takes that very seriously. We read about man of, a man of God as a man. And we're told there in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, watch, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And I understand that the context there is that Paul is urging the church at Corinth, act like men from a spiritual perspective. I think that also can be used for us to say, men, be a man. But be a man of God. The world is full of men that don't mind bossing everybody around, especially family members. The world is full of men that don't mind doing harm and, and, and hurting other people. The world is full of men that are so full of their ego, and I have said it and I'll say it till I die, the worst thing that a man has to deal with is his stinking male evo, e ego because it keeps us lifted up in pride it makes it so hard for us to even see someone else from an eye of compassion and love and a desire to help. Act like a man, a man of God. And fathers who are here this morning, we've got several young men in the audience. And my question for you is, are you bringing these young men up be a man of God and to be the kind of provider, protector, 
husband, father, as they need to be when they have families of their own. Men have been denigrated to the point that they aren't acting as men anymore. They do not embrace the role of leadership in the home. That is partly because back in the 60s when women's lib was in full bloom, and what happened? Men were dethroned, if you will. Men were no longer seen as something to be desired or even someone that you would want to submit to yourself. That denigrated their means to, to have no regard for as far as validity or, or, or importance. It means to belittle. And just look at the television. I don't watch these stinking shows because that's exactly what they are, stinking. But I have seen on the internet uh, just little snippets from a show of two and a half men. And all that is is two men with a young man that is living with them, the, the son of one of them, and, and all it does is make fun of the man. It, it just makes them look in such a ter terrible light. You look at how many of the sitcoms that are on television and have been on television. Uh, Everybody Loves Raymond is another one that I am aware of. That, that Raymond was just made fun of constantly and looked upon as being a, basically a bumbling idiot. And that's all because of the women's liberation. And I understand there's nothing wrong with women who were given similar or equal things as far as men in regard to a woman that does the job that she is supposed to do and she does it well. Why would she not? have the same kind of income that a man would. I was all for that and should be. There should be a, 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 an attitude of needing equality from the standpoint of an honest day's pay for an honest day's work and all the other things that are part of that. What really, really upsets me because I'm a golfer, or at least I used to be, and I love golf. But the women who win tournaments on the LPGA Tour here in America, their average first place prize is $282,000. The men on the PGA Tour who win their tournaments and those who win the tournaments, their first place prize is anywhere from $3.6 to $5 million. And brethren, Folks, that ain't right. That's just not right. And it never has been and never will be. So men, we need to take on that role. We need to assume and we need to embrace the role as the leader. We need to be a man and show our family, you can trust in me. I'll take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. You tell me what your problem is and I will do my very best to work with you and help you through that. And if you're not doing that, guys, then you're not God's man. Because God's man does all those things. Men have God-given responsibilities that they must accept and perform to be pleasing to God. Last thought this morning, brethren. Men, be mindful that you can miss heaven, heaven because of your unfaithfulness as a man of God failing to meet your responsibilities as a father. Please take that to heart. Men, please pay close attention to that. Young men who have your lives before you, Lord willing, who will one of these days be the head of families. Wouldn't it be ashamed if on the day of judgment you stand before Jesus Christ and he says, depart. You just wasn't much of a father. You weren't the man that I wanted you to be. You didn't follow the commands that I set forth in my word in regard to fatherhood. I don't recognize you. You're not mine. Depart from me. We've got an awesome responsibility, men. And if we will be good about meeting that responsibility, our wives will joyfully, gladly submit to our oversight, our rule, or our leadership as the head of the household. But if we're not going to do our job, don't expect our ladies, our women, 
our wives to give us the kind of love and respect that we want so much. It works in both ways. And we need to understand that if we want God to be pleased, we've got to do things as a man of God. Tom has selected for our song this, uh, this morning as I'll decide, I have decided to follow Jesus. And we hope this morning that you have made that decision already. But there are some in the audience as I look out over it that have not made that decision yet. And I keep on wondering why that is. Have you not heard enough of the gospel? Have you not heard enough of what God says in regard to salvation? Have you not heard enough about the horrors of hell? Have you not heard enough about the wonderful blessings of heaven that have not caused you or has caused you to be reluctant about obeying the gospel? What's holding you back? You know, I oftentimes ask someone who has never obeyed the gospel, what's holding you back? And you know what answer I get? Most of the time, I don't get one. Most of the time, the person doesn't even have an answer for that question. And it might be that maybe you just haven't thought about it enough. That you haven't thought about how wonderful it was for what we observed this morning in this memorial of Jesus going to the cross for you. Maybe you don't even see yourself as a sinner. Whatever it is, please think about that. Think about that this morning. Because those of us who have obeyed the gospel, I promise you, want nothing more than those who have never become a child of God to do so. If you stand accountable before God and you know you're accountable before God and you know you're a sinner, our prayer this morning is for you to obey Jesus Christ and let him save you from all your sins and that you will make the decision to follow Jesus right now while Tom leads us in this.